Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We're looking forward to a good discussion. We're not sure how this is going to go. These fellows have been preparing, and we had a few switch-ups right before, and a uh, few things, a few different directions we're going to go. So we are just hope this will be of some benefit to you. Been really blessed and fed by the talks and the humility and the, the passion. Uh, Dale, I tell you, how old a soul are you, sir? 76, praise God. Uh, we'd like to have one more child by, and number 10. And my wife said, you realize by the time she's 20, you'll be 77. Are you up to this? And I said, well, praise God. I mean, I'm not living for the, I'm trying to live one day at a time. And uh, Dale, you're just, a, I praise God. Uh, we heard about grumpy old people and uh, today we want to be sweet and kind. And I just love listening to your messages. You've been an inspiration, how God's breaking you and molding you. And you're coming out as gold. You're coming out beautiful spirit. And that woman beside you keeps loving you. And praise God, that's exciting. I tell my wife every day, thank you for marrying me. It's a, it's a real blessing. All right, fellas, let's, uh, let's have some introductions here first. Let's introduce Elisha. Elisha Byler, you all know him. I, he, uh, he spoke already, and Elisha, raise your hand for those who are new here tonight. He says he was, uh, grew up here in Pennsylvania was a member of Shippensburg Christian Fellowship, moved to Chihuahua in 1998 in Mexico, and uh, joined a, a non-affiliated Anabaptist church there. He, uh, he and I have something in common. We're both uh, Swiss hillbillies, and our wives are both Dutch. They're aristocratic Dutch. And they said to the Swiss, when they wanted the martyr's mirror, they said, uh, you guys down there over the mountains, you don't even know how to read and write. What do you need the, the the Martyr's Mirror translated in your language. But uh, we're doing okay, aren't we, Elijah? Yeah, all right. Your wife's and ends. That's great. Seven children. And uh, how far do you live from Creel? Four hours. So are you still in Chihuahua? Still in the state of Chihuahua. Four hours from Creel and working with the Tarahumara Indians, Native Americans. Amen. Praise God. All right. And tell me again, uh, you got your mic turned on there. Uh, something you'd like to do before you kick the bucket. I asked them all what they'd like to do before they go home to glory. That's the more dignified way to say it. Uh, go ahead. Well, there's a lot of things I'd like to do before I go to glory, but I have a, a list. Actually, I have <laughs> it written good. down. Wow. That's great. And, uh, and one of the things on the list is I would like to help someone, some younger man, go to a never-reached tribe. And what is your passion? My passion is exactly that, helping young men to become successful. In business. In business. In the kingdom. I'm young too, but younger men. Amen. In the kingdom. Wow. Praise God. Thank you. Next, let's go to uh, Brother Trent. Trent Eikenberry, Old German Baptist New Conference, wife Holly, seven children, four to 18, minister of the gospel, works with Cam, lived in Nigeria four and a half years, SALT program about six years, now operate a small ministry for street women in Jos, Nigeria. I want to see my children and grandchildren converted before I die is his his uh, thing that he'd like to do. He says he doesn't really have a hobby, but what's your passion, brother? Well, I'm not sure if this is on, but my passion is for ministry and for the kingdom of God. And that's kind of broad, but it's been the greatest joy of my life to serve the Lord and to be a minister and a preacher of the gospel. Wow, praise God. Okay, I have next uh, Philip Showalter. Uh, Philip, I appreciate you guys out there in Kentucky. Uh, do you consider yourself East Kentucky? Uh, Central. Central Kentucky. Okay, get your mic on because I'm going to ask you a question in a moment. 
Uh, you're married, how many children? Two girls. Two girls, and uh, you folks have a butcher shop, family butcher shop, meat processing facility. Uh, folks, I recommend all you go visit them. They're the most hospitable folks, and they'll give you a tour of their meat shop and all the different tastes and flavors. I was very blessed and impressed. And uh, what's your passion? Um, I would say Christ's kingdom, but in a, uh, I would say a single sense of that would be the church, and to see it united, to see it harmonious, to see it prospering is my passion. And what about uh, something you'd like to do before you kick the bucket? Well, uh, one ambition I toil with is um, to have a training program that I could maybe help out with to equip young men to be soldiers for the cross, preachers, wow. missionaries, uh, kingdom laborers for uh, the, the church in Christ's kingdom. Uh, so I asked him, I said, are, are you a, a minister of the gospel? He says, no. I says, that's wonderful. I says, did your congregation tolerate people like you? Or are they uh, intimidated? And he says, no. In our congregation, if I would say that I have this desire in my heart, they would ask how we can bless you. I got excited. I thought maybe we needed to ordain them right away and, and to get some oil and have an ordination, but he desisted. Okay, praise God. Kevin, Kevin Breckbill. Uh, Kevin, you tell how, how many, you said eight children or nine? Eight. Eight children. And uh, you live local here. And what congregation are you with there? Chambersburg Christian Fellowship. Chambersburg Christian Fellowship. Okay. Enjoyed your message. And uh, I told Mrs. Berceau, I said, did you hear that, those wonderful words of thanks that, uh, she, that you said for Brother David? That was very, very, very beautiful. To say thank you to those whose shoulders we stand on. None of us are self-made. Yes, praise God. Thank you. So, uh, what do you enjoy doing? You enjoy traveling, spreading the gospel, and planting churches. And you just came back from the Ukraine. What were you doing there? Visiting my son. Your son, what's he doing? Uh, he's helping take food into the Ukraine from Romania. Wonderful. Praise God. What's your passion? My passion is to uh, help church leaders learn to lead well. Say that again, learn. Help church leaders to learn to lead well. Church wow. leaders, uh, we have a, a dearth in the land of good leadership and knowing how to do it well, and wow. I have a passion to help and assist with that, wow. as I think the rest of these brothers do as well. Wow, praise God. I, I'm so excited to be here tonight. This was just a boost in my faith. I haven't been here for 15 years. I was bouncing my son on my knee and uh, tomorrow he's going to be uh, 17. He fell asleep uh, at that old campground over there. Brother Joel, Brother Denny, and Brother uh, John Martin were there. And uh, praise God. We've, it's amazing how life moves on. I was so blessed. Okay, and uh, something you want to do before you die. Oh, wow. I got a whole list of them things. Yeah. <laughs> I think I want to help establish two or three other churches in our local community would be my first uh, en endeavor. Praise God. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. We're looking forward to We'll go on now and we'll have in just a moment. Uh, my name is Nathan Overholt. My wife, Janet. Ma Janet, would you stand over there, honey? And uh, we'll have 18 years together this fall, Lord willing, if the Lord tarries and we live. Nine children, one to 17. I'm a minister at our little church plant in Hurricane Mills, Tennessee. I worked for 30 years as a landscape design installation contractor and now build metal buildings with my sons. And they're telling me, Dad, get off the ladder. That won't support you. And uh, come down, and they know more than I do. And so I am learning to be small. We operate a country store, Overholtz Farm Market, where our church community interfaces, we're just a few families, interfaces with the surrounding culture through the medium of food. We've been involved in singing and evangelism on streets and churches and over a good cup of coffee for most of my life. Lived and taught school in Poland for a year and a half for family led evangelism tours to Europe for seven years. Having had many sins and addictions, I am damaged goods and walk with a pronounced limp. 
but I'm thankful for God and his people's wonderful grace and mercy. My passion is my family and people. My brother Matthias and I, we uh, made it into the Brethren Guinness Book of World Records. That's the Church of the Brethren. Uh, John Winan, are you here tonight? John, where are you at? Back there. Go talk to him if you need a, some help getting a church started. Uh, you know, some of this church politics, and pardon me, uh, let me not, uh, I need a safe passage out of here. Who's in charge of this meeting? Um, uh, but I, I, anyhow, Brother John brought some elders down and uh, anointed us. He says, you know, this has got to be the first for a brother and elder to come down and lay hands on, on uh, some Amish Mennonite boys and ordain them to the ministry. And so we made it into the Guinness Book of World Records for the Brethren Church and probably the Amish Mennonite Church, too. Matthias and I would like to ordain 100 ministers of the gospel and start as many church plants before we die. Radical, Anabaptist-style, underground churches, followers of Jesus, whatever you want to call them. So that's a little lofty, but uh, we got to have at least some goals so we can come down along the stars if we miss the moon. Okay, I'm going to... Uh, step aside and I'm going to let uh, brother let's go first with brother Trent okay go ahead brother. all right I don't think any of us are confused by the fact that our age is fraught with quite a number of distractions, and I've chosen to talk to you tonight about one that is somewhat abstract, but I trust you'll understand. I, it was probably 10 years ago, maybe more like 15 years ago, I took a, about a three-year fast from media, and I was visiting with an older brother who is no longer alive, no longer with us. And he offered this thought, and I'm going to offer this same thought to you. He said, brother, are you sure that God intends for us to be infinitely distracted with the affairs that are going on all across the world at any given moment at precise points in every day? And I thought, yes, that is a very interesting thought. Now we need to understand that perhaps in the last 75 years, maybe just slightly longer than that, the world of media has radically changed, and specifically I'm speaking about news media, but the idea that we can be um, fed breaking news at every hour of the day that is up to the moment or up to the minute is relatively new in the world scene. And I think our grandparents would remember a time when there was a delay of, of one or two days, perhaps, and, and things like that. But I guess what I'm worried about is allowing modern media to take our attention and keep us focused on events that happen far across the world, and I'm not saying it's wrong to be concerned with those, but... but but being infinitely concerned with the Russian-Ukraine conflict, for instance. And yet, during that, that period of tension or that period of uncertainty that I have in my, in my life, I fail to see the very real needs and the very real struggles and the very real lost souls that exist within just a few miles or a few hundred yards of my own residence. Is that, is that clear what I'm trying to say there? And so I just, I just wrote this down. This distraction can cause us to fail to see the biblical ultimatum of following Christ in everyday life, effective discipleship, preserving purity of truth, and purposeful evangelism in our home communities as being of vital importance. And I just want you to think about that just a little bit. 
And I want to make another very clear point as I say this. And, and again, I want you to hear this clearly. I am not against understanding. I think it's important that we know what is going on, that we see the, the signs on the horizon. But I have a fear. I have a very clear fear that we do not appreciate enough what God is doing in this world with the barrage of negativity and the barrage of information about war and strife and famine and all of those things. And we are not looking cleanly enough at the God of heaven and understanding as clearly as we should be the, the, the stirring and the moving and the, and the presence of the Holy Spirit across this world. And, and that's just, a, that's just a, real, a real part of life. And you know, some of us, I'm afraid, have this testimony that the last thing I see at night is a, is a little screen about this big, and perhaps the first thing in the morning that I see is a little screen about this big. And I wonder what the fruit of that is, brethren. Can you have deep fellowship with God after Fox News has tantalized you with the latest scandals? And I think it's just something we need to think about as God's people. Just making a commitment to make sure that our eyes are fastened on Jesus. You know, we know those scriptures in Hebrews 12, perhaps the second verse, very, very well. That say, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. But I want to ask you tonight, and when we're talking about distractions, are your eyes fastened upon the beautiful things that God is doing in this world at this present day and making and causing faith to rise? And I think I'm almost out of time, but I wanted to go to a couple of scriptures in Matthew 24 just to categorize this a little bit. You don't have to turn here. But it said, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Could you detect from the modern news media that God is alive and working and moving and stirring among his people? Or can we be deceived that this world is falling apart at the seams? And, and it very well may be true, many of those things, but I'm afraid that it takes our eyes off of our Lord Jesus and off, off those beautiful things that God is doing. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And I'm not sure how far I want to read here. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And why I read those verses, I guess just centered around this theme right here, is that we do already know the ultimate reality that is coming on this world. And it, it does not do us a lot of good to sit and wring our hands at the things that Christ has so explicitly explained, will come, shall come, shall proceed, and all of that. But there are a tremendous amount of things that, that our Lord Jesus and God is doing in this world that would encourage us and cause us to rise up and take away some of the negativity in our own hearts if we would allow that. And I, I think that's probably all I need to say. Um, about that at this point. Okay, awesome. All right, brothers. Thank you very much. You can take your seat. Yes, sir. Okay, we have a farm market 
And uh, through this whole COVID pandemic, uh, plan, plan de- excuse me, uh, pandemic, if I can say that right, uh, I put some signs out. And I said, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Now, I didn't even, they're just my hand-painted signs. And, and uh, my kids are like, Dad, you've got to make it look nicer than that. Anyhow, another sign I put out was uh, Dr. Linus Pauling says, take uh, uh, a minimum of 5,000 and up to 30,000. Uh, he won two Nobel Prizes, by the way. And somebody said, well, so did Barack Obama. But anyhow, but beside the point, uh, sometimes I'd like to take sign. I'm like, I get so... I'm, I'm like, Lord, I'd like to just paint a big sign of that. I'd like to speak to the present age or to the present. What did Jesus do when he was here? And brothers, what do you think uh, were some thoughts, that you, questions that you have for Trent? Now, I might also say, uh, Joe, where's Joe? Joe, uh, on the on our program, Joe, come on up quickly. You want us? I asked him to say something here. Joe Kurtz. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to mention, or, or Nathan asked me to mention that uh, while this is going on, it's not too late. You can still submit questions for the panelists. And if Nathan keeps this moving along, we may be able to get to them. So watch the clock. But you can submit them and go to the website, go to the 2023 events page, scroll down, and there's a a button you can click on that says submit questions for the panel. And at the very end, I'll be bringing those up. Thank you, sir. So we most likely will circle back around. Somebody else will have. Go ahead, Elisha. Brother Trent, I really appreciated the comment that you made about keeping our focus on the Lord Jesus himself and and also about um, the Lord has prophesied many of the things that will happen around the world in a general sense. Uh, Brother, do you think that we should be informing ourselves for the uh, for the so that we can be praying and and all of that? Or should we just uh, stay out of it? Or should we partially be partially involved? Do you have any, any thoughts on that? So I did know that this is the part that would get me into trouble. Um, I, I do want to be very clear that, that we need to be watching. We need to be aware. But at some level, we've got to be able to understand that there are many things that we absolutely cannot control. And a lot of us are living in anxiety about world events that, that really there is, there is really almost nothing you can do in your everyday life. And, and this, this doesn't sound right because I was going to say besides prayer, and that's, that's a terrible thing to say. That's one of the most <laughs> important things that we can do. Amen. Uh, it should be calling us to prayer. Hmm. But I just sense as I talk to people that that it is entirely possible to get far too wound up in this. And, and we need to keep that focus that we are looking for the Lord's return. We are, we're looking at world events and, and yet not saturated with it. Because the other side of that is the fact that we do need to be looking for what God is doing. And, and your, your national medias are not going to give you that. Mm-hmm. And we need to look to other sources sometimes. Ed, what do you think? My name's Kevin. I mean, Kevin. Sorry, I was thinking of your cousin. He knows my cousin. Yeah, his cousin. We had a fight. So you asked the question, what did Jesus up. do? Uh, how did he respond to the current political s- scene? If you go back and look at the p- current political scene, it probably had just as much of excitement going on just as much of division, just as much of, dra- as much of a drama. Did he say much about it? Hmm. Was he engaged in protest? Hmm. Was he engaged in correcting Some. one side versus the other? Just hmm. didn't hear much about it. Hmm. And so I don't really have a question. I would just make a comment that I think it's simple. What you 
absorb is who you'll become. Let's not fool her. I mean, the only person you're going to fool is yourself. Hmm. Okay. Yes, Trent. Okay, I want to say one more thing about this. He helped me jog my memory just a little bit. So I thought a little bit about Jesus. And I think we could safely say that, that at that point in time, there was no one in the world that knew more about world conditions than Christ did. Wow. But, but you didn't see anything but a, a keen focus on serving God and meeting the needs that were right at hand around him. Praise God. Well, that's exciting. We'll circle around. Thank you so much. Uh, Elisha, we'll go next to you. Come on forward. And this is called the distraction of pop-up theology. Now, I will also say, Brother Martin, Brother uh, uh, Joel's father and mother have a book table, Facing infota Infotainment Technologies, Evolution Beyond Human, Daniel Ray Mast. Uh, it's available on their book stand. Pick that up, please. Yes, sir. All right, so I, I decided to choose a title that hopefully will help us to remember this. I called it Pop-Up Theology. Now, this is actually a term that's being used, and there's apparently a leader of a megachurch that actually wrote a book and called it Pop-Up Theology. But I feel like there's a distraction that's facing the church today. Hosea 4, verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And so one of the distractions which I feel the church of today is facing is what I have chosen to call pop-up theology. What I am about to share is for everyone, but I would especially like to invite the youth to pay attention. In recent years, there has been a proliferation of religious ideology spread through social media platforms, music, movies, etc. So much of this pop-up theology is old heresy covered with a skimpy varnish of Christian terminology. The reason it often influences people is because it often contains a measure of truth, and yet so often it's only a half-truth. It leaves out important balancing truths, or it mixes truth with error. Its supposed truth has usually not been forged on the anvil of suffering or been prayed through. The underlying influence is often humanistic. It lifts up self instead of encouraging people to take up the cross and die to self. I'll probably step on some toes here, but that's all right. I'm prepared for that. <clears throat> to be specific, several influences that have been circulating among the Anabaptist people. The Chosen series, the Kendrick Brothers movies, CCM music, Christian contemporary music, songs with poor theology, and a barrage of humanistic ideology which is often spread through social networking, WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, etc. Following are several specific points which concern me. I am concerned about movies which are produced by people who do not profess faith in Christ. They are not trying to build Christ's kingdom. On social media platforms, you find phrases like, just be yourself, or follow your dreams, or don't give up, that's not who you are. Follow your heart. It's focused on me, on, on, it's a humanistic focus. All of this is producing what we might call indoctrination through osmosis. It's usually a slow, almost imperceptible influence in people's lives. So often there's a mixture of truth and error. Someone who is undiscerning will likely swallow the whole thing, not realizing the danger, or that it might be a half-truth. Sometimes the biggest problem is not so much what is said, but what is left unsaid. 
And the reason I'm using the term pop-up is because all this stuff is being thrown at us without our invitation. Before the days of electronic communication, information was spread either orally or through books. Now with this bombardment of entertainment theology, it is so easy for our youth to be distracted from deep, genuine Bible study. So the true knowledge of God is always Christ-centered. It takes the way of the cross. It is Bible-based. It is Holy Spirit illuminated and made personal through practical experience, often suffering. Pop-up theology is peer-oriented. <clears throat> it's, it's spread among peers. It is humanistic. I remember going to, an, to a concert where there was almost entirely Anabaptist people. And I want to be careful here. I don't want to throw stones. But the one song was focused on, show me who I am. Show me who I am. Show me who I am. I said, Lord, show me who you are. I know that I'm not worth looking at. Little or no mention of the cross of repentance, of the blood of Christ, of resurrection, life, and power, of the Holy Spirit. There's usually a tragic mixture of truth and error. That's what rat poison is made of. Good and evil, good and bad, food and poison. And that's what we have with this barrage of pop-up theology. So how can we combat this distraction I've listed a few things here. There could be many more. Study the scriptures. Pray and meditate on the scriptures. So often we read our Bibles and then just quickly go on. We need to develop the, the, uh, the habit of praying and meditating on the scriptures. Listen to the Holy Spirit speaking to us personally and corporately through the scriptures. And this last one here is, is something I want us all to pay attention to. Cultivate personal relationships between older, mature believers and younger believers. A survey done several years ago revealed that about 75% of the influence coming into the lives of youth in Christian homes today in America is coming from their peers. And that's a huge problem. I would like to challenge... Hmm, something... Disappear on my phone here. <laughs> I would like to challenge the older believers here to be proactive in discipling younger believers. And I would like to challenge the younger believers to actively seek counsel from older believers on a regular basis. So that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we, uh, what do, what do you fellows think? Who wants to start us out? Philip. Well, I say a hearty amen to that brother, but to ask a, uh, fate question, <laughs> should I only read books of people who were dead 200 years ago or 300 years ago, or should I only listen to hmm. songs by those that were, you know, at least 200 years a girl who actually wrote them, um, Good. or is there is there a place and time to enjoy some more modern, uh, contemporary, in the sense of more recent, uh, written and also maybe hmm. a more updated style? Is there ever a place and time to listen to music like that, or is there a place and time to read books by even Protestant friends of ours who are contemporaries? Ooh, Go ahead and answer that stuff. question if you don't mind. Yeah, so I actually do read a lot of old authors that have been dead for several hundred years. Uh, that's probably the, the largest percentage of what I read. But I also do read some, some uh, contemporary books. But the whole thing of, of praying and meditating on the scriptures and filling ourselves with the scriptures, that prepares us to... Uh, to distinguish what is good and what's not good. And so certainly there's, there's a lot of you know, literature and books out there that's really inspiring, 
but there's also a lot that's not. And so the question about Protestant sources, uh, personally, I have been very positively influenced by Protestant sources, I have. But I still consider myself an Anabaptist. And um, <clears throat> I believe that God has one church. The Bible tells us uh, very clearly there's one church, one body. And if we, if we reject other members of Christ's body uh, simply because of their affiliation, I think we cut off some of the blessing that God is, would, would give us. And so personally, I do. I do. Uh, songs, I do listen to some songs that have been written recently, but there again, we must filter it all through God's word. So then how would you, how would you, how would you um, navigate that? So what's, what's safe to read and what's safe to listen to? Is Rick Warren safe? Is Joel Osteen okay? Um, how would you uh, guide us in some of those questions of more recent authors like that? Yeah, I'm not quite sure why you mentioned Joel Osteen because I think he's the one that wrote the book on the pop-up theology. <laughs> 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 but um, <clears throat> so I guess the concern that I really have is that the older and the younger need to partner together. That's the burden on my heart. I talked to a brother, an older brother, a few years ago, and. And he was talking about some of the, 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 the Mennonite conferences that kind of slid over into liberalism and modernism. And I asked him, I said, you know, I know that some people would blame missions as the cause of that. I said, what do you see, brother? You're older. He said, you know what I think it was? He said there was a disconnect between the older and the younger. Wow. The younger were going and getting higher education. The older were perceived as more ignorant. And so the younger got together among themselves and, and they were just, uh, they were influencing each other and the whole group of, of younger, the younger generation just slid off into mm. worldliness. Mm. And he, he felt as if, if they would have anchored themselves to the older, that would have kept them. And I think wow. the same thing is exactly what we're facing Trent, today. Next. Trent, you got a comment, you got a question for, for Elijah. Okay, I really appreciate this discussion and one of the keys, I'd like to just have you explain a little bit more right here, the disconnect between the older and the younger. Hmm. Um, could you give some advice for young people as to how to approach older people? I, and I realize we older ones need to be more proactive in, in reaching out. But, but how would you suggest for a young person that's seeking answers, seeking guidance to approach someone that has wisdom and understanding? Well, I think the younger ones should do that. I did that to Brother Lynn Martin. Kevin gave credit to Lynn, and I want to do the same thing. Lynn was, was a very approachable leader. But I heard a comment recently. Someone said that it's, it is not the responsibility of the younger to seek the older. It is the responsibility of the older to go find the younger. And I, I believe that's biblical. Wow. Hmm. Okay, we're going to go on. You know, we could talk about music also. The bridge, oh, you know, when, do, you know, we don't want to start tearing out pages out of our hymn book. In fact, our family just recently learned to sing a Johnny Cash song. Sorry, John D. Martin. Uh, and I, I said to uh, people who were getting a little nervous, I, I, maybe they were going to get nervous, I decided to inform them before. I said, you know, we, we just sang, uh, I heard you guys sing Martin Luther's A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And uh, he tortured a few of your relatives, uh, or his people did, and uh, I didn't hear Johnny Cash uh, been burning anybody lately, or anybody. So, so at our store, we, we, we had... Uh, we had uh, 18 CDs of uh, Roy Gingrich and the group there from, uh, what's it called? Altar of Praise. I mean, ah, just like spectacular, you know? And, and, and now we have a lot more uh, CDs playing. We always got good music, and it's turned the volumes loud enough that people have to make a decision. They either start moving with the songs as they come in our store, or they give us an email that says, your music's too loud. And so... 
I, I, I tear up. I go through the store. I hear power in the blue. I'm like, oh, man, what are people thinking? <laughs> you know, uh, so I'm very thankful, yet we have a platform. But, you know, it's getting a little, little more uh, the praise and worship, you know, the Church of Christ. And, you know, I like some of those songs, but uh, hmm, where are we going? Uh, anyhow, it's a, it's a bridge. So I guess, what could we say? Uh, we need to be wide read. And listen widely, but just don't listen. Don't follow the direction that people are going. That's, that's a tall order. And you guys, you fathers, you're going to have to explain that to your children. You're going to have to work it out. Can I okay. say something? Yes, sir. So we heard a lot about what we shouldn't listen to. And do you know why we're so influenced by modern Christianity? It is because they have good teachers, and they have produced a lot of books. The weakness of the historic faith and a Baptist is that we have not produced a lot of books and writers. So I know we got different people attempting to do that, um, but I want to encourage us to start writing more. Uh, if, if we don't have books to turn to, the younger generation will turn to the books that's available. Uh, so let's step up to the plate. We got a hole that can be filled, and I encourage everyone to do it. And, and you know, and I want to say, every generation we're looking for life. All you brothers, we, you know, we've been down this road. We, we want life. We want something alive. We want a compelling faith. We don't want something that's just stuck and, you know, do it because I said you need to do it. We want something that really works, uh, you know, down in our area, you know, we, uh, there's a few folks still handle some snakes. Uh, not necessarily recommend that to you, but, uh, you know, we like to see some action and movement. All right, let's go on to the next one here. Maybe we need to get a little more excited. As excited about making money as we are about starting churches. Amen. Starting kingdom, little kingdom nooks. All right, let's go on to the next one. Uh, Brother Philip, materialism, the temptation of materialism. I'm going to sit here, I'll let you go around. The distraction of materialism. Many of our communities are caught up and consumed with stuff and things and with making lots and lots of money. In fact, many Anabaptists today are known for being industrious and wealthy. You can drive through any one of our larger communities, you'll soon see you see lots of industry and lots and lots of wealth. The kingdom of God has become secondary and the physical has become the primary for many of our people and their communities. In fact, even... Often the church elder is far from being exempt from this distraction of materialism. The church, missions, and the lost souls around come behind business, money, and temporal pursuits. Lots of nice farms, big houses, expensive vehicles, thriving businesses, and pleasant, elaborate vacations have become way too normal for our people. But little investment, little time, and little sacrifice is made for the kingdom. Little effort is made to reach lost myriads of souls around the globe. We're slow to disrupt our soft, comfortable, cozy, quiet lives for the sake of Christ and his gospel. We'll sacrifice the kingdom over our businesses. Money often means more to us than the kingdom of God. Often, far too often, our own souls are lean and sickly. Far too often, we lack the power of God in our own lives. Spiritual poverty is all too normal and sadly even at times expected of our churches. But our banking accounts and businesses are fat and flourishing because we have become consumed with materialism. We often mistake covetousness for industriousness. 
We often mistake greediness for good stewardship. We often mistake a materialistic person for being simply an opportunist. I think in short, we have found clever ways to baptize our covetousness. We have found convenient, slick, clever ways to justify our love for money. You know, and this right here is true worldliness. I'm burdened and concerned about drift and carnality and the cool spirit and fads and fashions, but this right here is worldliness. Christ said, after all these things the Gentiles are seeking, and in my kingdom it should look different, but does it? Are we worldly? You know, I'm not advocating poverty and selling all that you have and being just a pauper. Rather, it's about priority. What do you love in life and what are you pursuing? What's the ambition deep in your heart? Is it money and business and your security? Business can be a tool and business even can be a great tool for the kingdom. But materialism is never okay. And loving money is a sin and even idolatry. Hard work and diligence is a virtue that I want to just appraise and appreciate. Hard work is good and being industrious is commendable. But the focus on money and our accumulation of money is the problem right there. And the result of all this is that we, that we have today lots of cold, sleepy, powerless churches. The result of this is that we have a lot of carnal young people who don't have much of a passion for the kingdom, don't much have a heart for God and sacrificing for the kingdom. They love pleasure, recreation, fun, and social events that are empty and light and frivolous. Also, the result is that we have lost the glory of God in our churches. Too often we have Ichabod on the church doors. The glory hath departed. So I want to challenge us today, I want to challenge you tonight to stop justifying our materialism. Stop baptizing that sin. I want to challenge us to repent of our love for money. I want to challenge you to begin to seek first the kingdom and to set your heart and affections on things above. I want to challenge you to begin to gaze at the eternal and let that recalibrate your priorities in life. Get a hold of those realities and have it affect your banking accounts and your business. And when this happens, when this really happens, we will see revival once again in our day. I'm convinced. When this happens, we'll begin to impact our world for God again. I believe this matter is at the heart and the core of our lukewarmness. And may God help us. Whew. Man, let's just give an older call. Whoa. You think he's right? Huh? Now, Elisha, you're just a missionary down there in Mexico. You know, you're, you probably don't have a big business, but, you know. Uh. <laughs> I don't have a big business. <clears throat> But I, I come to the U.S. periodically, and the biggest culture shock I have is coming this way, not going that way. Mm. Mm. But I, I, I don't really have a question, but I have one comment I'd like to make. Sometimes we, we see older brothers uh, concerned about the passions of the younger brothers and their sports and things like that. But sometimes the older brothers don't consider that their passions are just as unrestrained in their big businesses and some of those pursuits the the um there's the the lust of the flesh the, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and sometimes the older men are caught up in the pride of life just as much as the young men in the lust of the flesh and so i wow. just want to say amen brother that's that was very good and i i, I stand behind that now uh thank you Lisha. trent you work for cam uh, I mean, these folks are hardworking people out here, and they give lots of money, and they give their their uh, investments away to Cam. 
Now, uh, he was stepping on you guys' toes. If, I mean, if we wouldn't be working hard like this and be, be uh, uh, you know, movers and shakers, uh, you guys wouldn't have any money to operate in all those missions. <laughs> Trent, you're on. <laughs> okay, I thought that would come. <laughs> Well, so, so this, is a, this is a real reality, but I don't necessarily want this to temper the ultimate um, message that, that our, our dear brother was putting out there, because it is about priority. Hmm. But, but there is some reality, and I'm going to ask Brother Philip a question about this. You know, for those of us who have lived overseas for numerous years, you do begin to realize that that if everyone at home lived hand to mouth, um, there would not be a lot of mission work and a lot of effective things that happen across mm. the world. Mm. Um, but that being said, the, the priority of how that is done, we are not tapping the potential mm -hmm. among our people. We, we're keeping most of that to ourselves. There is so much more work that could be done in the world. And so I want to I ask our dear brother Philip how, how he would see, or perhaps give some examples from their family business, how you, you channel the bulk of that, that resource and income into the kingdom of God. Awesome. Good question. I'll try to answer that. Um, and I said there that business can be a tool and even a great tool for the kingdom. And I am all for business. I'm all for even some larger businesses. But what I would love to see is every successful business owner driving about a $5,000 car or less. You got me? Or less. Hmm. And if you could be giving about 90% of your income or more, that would be commendable. The problem is that we use our businesses for selfish purposes. It goes back into our own pockets, back into our own high-class rides. And we're driving cars that are way beyond the value that kingdom cars should be. Woo. <laughs> and we're taking all these elaborate vacations and big honeymoons and everything else, and it's all for our own lust. So instead of it being for God's kingdom, it's for your own status, and that is wrong. Wow. When your business being successful shows up in your rides and your status of life, something's wrong there. That should be given right to the kingdom, to this dear brother here for Cam, and you should be living on a pretty slim salary and giving the bulk of that to the kingdom. So I think therein we err a lot right there, is that if my business is successful, then God's blessing me, so I should, I should express that and enjoy that. And that's wrong. That's wrong. Hmm. And I think we baptize our covetousness way too much. And I'm all for having a, a successful business, but why not give it to the kingdom? Almost make it into a nonprofit business for you, but profitable for the Lord. And if we could get a hold of that reality, I think it would do us a lot of good. And let your children taste some poverty, though you're wealthy. Let your children enjoy some nice more rusty vehicles because you want to give to the kingdom, lay up treasure where it never rusts, no stocks will affect it, no crash will ever affect that up there. And so I think we do well to heed this and to go home and maybe sell some cars. Hmm. Maybe go home and consider even downsizing your house and endeavor to be among those who are lowly and humble and broken because we want to reach them people around us but also, frankly, give more to the kingdom. It'll do you good and your children a world of good if you get a hold of more of that value in your life. Wow. That was like John the Baptist preaching. Whew. That's, 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 that's amazing. Let's just stop right there. Okay. Next. Kevin. Uh, folks, this is the pique your interest and to get discussion going in your next group session and throughout the weekend and takes these this is not going to answer your questions just to whet your appetite and to get the your creative juices flowing 
So praise God. Thank you so much. Uh, man, you're, you're really radical. Uh, wow. I, I, my flesh was recoiling. I mean, we drove holy vans, and they'd say, here comes a holy man. He looked like me. He was driving. He said, a holy man in his holy van. <laughs> the kids made fun of us. Man, I don't like that. I'd like to save my children some of that uh, embarrassment, brother. Embrace the cross, he says. Well, I already moved to Tennessee, and I had my children give up their youth group and all their friends and a comfortable business, and uh, you still think I should give up more? I'm not saying that for sure. I would think that could be a race. Woo, get ready, children. <laughs> a holy man in his holy van. Yeah, get ready, Dad. That's more like it. Amen. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay. Kevin. All right, so my ideas aren't quite as lofty as the other three. When I think of church success, I think of what does it take to have a healthy church? And we can talk about a lot of high ideals and throw around lofty ideas, but what does it take at home for you and your church to be successful? That's my question. And when they sent me the list of distractions and temptations, my first thought went to gossip. Now, why gossip? Does gossip, what does gossip do? So I want to do two things. Do you understand what gossip actually does or how bad it is, number one? But then more importantly, I want to influence you of how to resolve gossip and what to do on the other side. So we can tell you how terrible gossip is. Have you ever read the Bible that talks about how what gossip actually does? I'm just gonna read a couple verses and um, what's your gut reaction when you hear about the word gossip? Do you feel the same way when you think of you heard someone committed adultery? Like, does it do anything? Does gossip bother you? Or should it bother you? I mean, it's just, let's, let's read a couple of verses here. So it says, um, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. It says they're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish. They perhaps, there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. Wow. It's a part of the strong language is gossip. Wow. So this is what happens with gossip. It's this idea of discussing about others. You talk about things that you really shouldn't talk about about other people. Now what you don't know, it does two things to you that you're not aware of. Number one is what it does to you of how you feel towards that brother. You're, you don't realize what that does. And then we say we wanna have healthy churches and we're discussing one another. Okay? The second thing it does is if I talk about Brother Nathan here negatively, who do you know back there? John Martin. All right, if I tell John Martin. <laughs> what it does to their relationship, okay? So you get this process going. I happen to have meetings here with individuals in this audience, and the churches are struggling to be united. At the root of it, it's massive gossip. So how do you combat gossip? What is the most effective way to combat gossip? Prayer? Prayer? Actually, I would disagree with that. It's a good thing to do. even something better to talk 
a good report about your brothers and sisters. That's the only thing that should come out of your mouth about, your, about one another. Now, what does that do, how you feel toward your brothers and sister? It feels good. It builds up. What does it do if I talk good about John to you? You're going to respect him and love him more. And even vice versa. Yeah. It builds up. That's right. We don't realize what this does among us. Forgive us, Lord. <coughs> Whoa. Yeah. Ooh, that was short. Okay, well, listen, at the table, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan says all great change in America gets done around the, uh, the, the dinner table. Sit down, son, right here. Sit down. And, 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 you know, I mean, we want to have interaction with our children, and we want to talk about the things of the day. And, I mean, it's okay to talk about people, isn't it? I mean, it's just the news. Uh, <laughs> go for it, Kevin. So when the brothers were talking about media, I was wondering how much of it is gossip. Oh. Mm. Okay, now what is, what is, Kevin, clarify a little bit for us, what is the definition of gossip? I mean, how, I mean, uh, I mean can't we say anything about anybody? I mean, do I have to just be quiet? I mean... That's like an out-of-body experience. Definition. Definition. A person who habitually reveals personal and sensational facts, not, not ideas, facts about others. That sounds like the news. Say it again. Then Trent, you're next. Go ahead. Say it again. A person who habitually, what'd you say? Habitually and sensationally reveals facts, facts about others. Okay. I'm going to address the moderator here for just a minute. <laughs> oh, man. But, but seriously, I heard a beautiful song come from their family this morning that I would like him to repeat some of those words. Um, that, 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 was a, that, that, that was a deeply moving moving song this morning. Could you just repeat that or yes. maybe sing it for us? I hear people talking about people most everywhere I go. To hear them talking, they were there when it happened. There's nothing that they don't know. You may not approve of the things I do, but if you're going to talk about me, make sure what you're saying is done while you're praying and please say it on your knees. Yeah, I can never, the second verse says, I can never don't tell your neighbor, for he can never give me the grace to see me through. Go on. All right. Thank you, brother. Brother Kevin, I really appreciate this. And um, I think I'd like to hear more about combating gossip. And, you know, I thought of a verse I think of often, maybe one of the most difficult verses in the New Testament to to reach but Philippians 2 would tell us that in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves Forgive us, Lord. and would that be an effective way to to minimize this temptation or distraction 100% I would say that's at the root of it um, another way to help combat it is in your church um, when you find yourself talking, encourage the culture in your church. It's a buzzword right now to have healthy culture. You know, it's healthy culture, culture in churches, healthy culture in your business, healthy culture in communities. All this is a big buzzword. So let's use it for the good. You want something healthy? Have your brothers and sisters tell you when you're gossiping. Be open to that. I promise you, if somebody tells you that once or twice, <laughs> It's Ouch. very effective. Whew. I enjoy it. I want to know. Um, in our church, we have really tried to become sensitive to that. Hmm. And I would say it's not our theology that makes a healthy church per se. Hmm. It can maybe destroy it at levels. Hmm. But it, the healthiness is how you relate to one another. Hmm. Like, you, wanna, you want someone to come to your church 
Have a safe culture in your church. Safe culture. To confess and that it won't get gossiped about. It's a safe place. You're going to have people show up you don't want to do with. But if you have an unsafe church, they're not going to show up. So it's up to each of us to be those people and not to gossip. I think it's huge. I think it's way worse than we realize. I don't think I realize how easy it is to gossip. So I think it's a constant development that we learn. It's not a one-time event. It, it, it's, it, we develop that sensitivity. But we need one another to help, help us learn that. Wow, that's powerful. So I'm going to take that home to our church and to my family, first of all. And I'm going to ask my children, to, when I start gossiping, to raise their hand and to uh, admonish me. I'm going to try that. Uh, my dad used to do that, and he would stop us, and he'd say, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. He says, uh, they're not here to defend themselves. And uh, so he would stop us. I need to do a little more of that. Uh, thank you. More comments here. Elisha. So I have a question for you, Kevin. <clears throat> you mentioned about not saying anything behind someone's back that would be uh, about their negative actions or anything like that. So the Bible tells us things that people did that were not good. Uh, do you have any comments on that? So like the Bible tells us that David sinned with Bathsheba, for example, right? That wasn't a nice thing. Ooh. And it does tell us that. So do we ever have the right to say things like that about someone or should we not talk about things like that? Should we always just talk about the good things? Uh -huh. Very good. It won't hurt you to only talk about the good things. I think you're going to become a lot more appreciative of your brothers and sisters. If somebody does something wrong, is it wrong to make a comment? But see, gossip doesn't ever stop at the stop there. It wants to continue. Did you hear? Did you hear? And after a while, a thousand things is said. I mean, have you ever heard a story that after it's been... I mean, you look at this group here. If we started a story in the back, God only knows what it would be until it got up here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, let's, let's just be realistic about it. Um, let's focus on good report. I think it's very, very wow. powerful in a witness of a world that is bombarded by news and negativity. If you want something different, have a different culture among us. Now, uh, that, just for anyhow, I'm going to throw this out. As I was thinking about your talk, Kevin, uh, that word busybody means elotrio episcopos, which means a bishop uh, a, 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 an elder who's reaching into another elder's bishop, his area of, of, of labor, and meddling with his affairs. Sorry? He's trying to help him. Yeah, he's trying to help, praise God. Poor guy. Uh, poor brother. Oh, excuse me, poor elder. Uh, hmm. Busy bodies. Hmm. Okay. Well, this is good stuff. Uh, we have more questions coming. Come on, Joe. Okay, here's somebody handed me something. Gossip, a three-part definition. Bad news from a bad heart behind someone's back. Okay, what you got? These with names. Awesome. All right. Are applicable. And then yes. the other ones are questions. Okay. The wider topic. Okay, if you got any more questions, send them in. We're not going to take them all, but we'll, we'll go down through a few. Elisha, I'm so excited to hear of your vision to start churches, ordain elders, and empower young men. Do short-term missions divert time and money from these visions? So over the years, we've had a number of short-term people come and spend time with us. Uh, I was telling you the story of the young man who uh, joined me for a night out on the, uh, in the wilderness, and we got wet and all of that. That was a short-term trip. But today that young man is serving in the mountains with the Tarahumara people. And so um, <clears throat> over the years, many people have come and wanted to do a short-term trip, and they want to be a blessing to us. And I tell them, well, that's great, but the blessing is going to go to you. You're coming to learn and hopefully get a vision, but we're not really expecting you to do much for the, for the mission itself. Okay. Philip, an Anabaptist preacher once said, if God has not called you to mission work, 
he has called you to earn money to support the missionaries. What are your thoughts on this idea? An Anabaptist preacher once said, if God has not called you to mission work, he has called you to make money for the missionaries. Well, that's not scriptural, I wouldn't say necessarily. Um, there's no verse that says that in my Bible. <laughs> but the uh, principle, I think, does hold some truth. Yes, sir. Um, but I would say that we're all to be active in the kingdom. Aren't we all missionaries? I thought we were all missionaries. That's a good point. A very good point. So I would say if you're not called to foreign work, then you're called to local work Amen. is how I would see that. And that may be making a lot of money mm. to give to the kingdom. Amen. Not for your own use, but for the kingdom. Mm. And so I would say the, uh, the, the need of the hour isn't so much money as much as it is personnel. People who are equipped and ready to be a vessel for God to use. So God's need is not so much money as able workers. And so if you have a, a, uh, a heart to give, amen. Give it and give it liberally and be a cheerful giver. But I would say uh, make sure your motives are pure in that and that you have um, came to God and God has made that very clear to you. And I, I would say ideally through your ministry and through the Holy Spirit, that should be your main purpose. I would, I would wonder if the purpose should be that you would seek God about being a laborer locally, if not foreign, first of all. But maybe that could be a good one to be engaged in, is giving to the kingdom. But give it liberally, not as a side project. Okay, thank you. Uh, you fellows, if you've got something to say also, just uh, speak up real quickly. Okay, Trent. Do you have recommended sources for news that we won't get addicted to? You know what? I'm not sure that I want Choke to Choke up just a little bit there, brother. Choke it up. All right. We'll make sure it gets nice and loud. I'm not sure that I necessarily want to endorse sources, um, but I do think that, that we should be careful, you know, and grade those things. Um, and basically, basically temper our time. Now, something that I have noticed, I, you've heard me mention Fox News several times. They're kind of heralded as, you know, the conservative... Uh, news outlet in the, in the United States today. But I, I have observed just in my, in my time with them that they are also very, very quick to give you the scandalous bits, the, you know, the little pieces that have shameful immodesty. Um, those things are all very near to the front, probably more than some other, some other outlets. And, and I think we need to be really careful about that. Um, and so I guess I'm going to be dumb enough to say, you know what, I don't actually have a complete answer for that, and I'm not sure I want to just uh, recommend specific sources. There are a number of very good news outlets that, that do attempt to be unbiased and attempt to, to uh, grade their, their materials fairly well. Um, some of you probably know those better than I do, but, but I think we need to just take care and, and keep this in our, the top of our consciousness. Okay. Uh, Kevin, in response to Brother Kevin's comments about gossip, what about discussing what we should do as churches? If there is another church that is allowing a brother to continue in sin, So this church is allowing another brother to continue in sin, we think, and, and we're like, man, you know, we should, maybe we should help out a little bit here. Uh, is that gossip? I don't know. It sounds like that definition that you talked about earlier, about busybodies getting in other people's business. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. I guess my point is, like, 
it's not profitable. Let's, let's talk about things that are profitable. It's really where I want to take it. And like every, there's this temptation to think that if we thought, talk about a problem, hmm. we'll help it and contribute. Hmm. It just seldom brings a healthy response. It seldom does. We don't realize it. And I really want to direct people and push people towards learning to speak the best about every brother and sister. And like, and I'm not this idiotic, idealistic person. Uh, I actually think it's a real thing that we can accomplish. I think it's very attainable. It's very workable. So and I think that builds, builds churches. So are you afraid of me? Am I afraid of you? Yes. Not really. Not no. yet. Not yet. Well, okay. <laughs> now, well, so, but you don't really know me, but I'm going to talk to you about some concerns. We call it concerns in yeah. the church or concerns about, you know, situations. I'm from another state. Will you have the courage to tell me, uh, I think you're gossiping. I probably would. Would you really? Well, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, another way that uh, gossip comes up is through prayer request. Woo, praise God, prayer request. Amen. <laughs> How many of y'all agree with that one? Oh, did you see that, Kevin? All right, next. Uh, Elisha and Trent. We talked about giving most of our wealth to missions because we need to live more simply. And yet a lot of the money is given, a lot of the money given is used to keep the missionaries comfortable and above the living standards of the people we're trying to reach. Your thoughts, please. <laughs> now we're all gonna come down and see where you live. <laughs> You beat me to it. I, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the home we live in now, I did not build the house. It was built by someone else. And uh, so it's okay. It's bigger than some of my neighbors. It is. You don't but I have more a, children than they you, do, too. You don't live in, the ca in a cave in the side of the mountain? I used to live in a tent. Did you? Uh, I lived in a tent for three and a half months. And Did then you we trade lived in a your, sand, your, 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 your uh, car tire sandals in at the border, or where are they? Those are pretty snappy. I used shoes. to use car tire sandals, <clears throat> and I hiked door to door for five years. And then I did it for another five years, uh, part time. But I began to realize that the natives themselves were bringing the, the new people in, and it wasn't from my efforts. And so I quit hiking as much. Um, and so at this point, my, my focus is more leadership development. But we started out in a one-room adobe and stone house. It was very, very similar to the natives. I, but I, I do want to say, I, was, I have been very, very thankful for, the, for the, uh, the donations that have come in over the years. There have been godly people who live on a higher standard than what I would be comfortable with. And I'm not here to judge them or gossip about them. And I am very, very <laughs> thankful and grateful to the generous people that have donated over the years. Thank you. Uh, some of them were, have been very wealthy people, some very poor people. But I am so thankful and so grateful to every one of them. And so um, I don't really have a lot of negative things to say, but I just want to encourage us you know, the Bible says that if we give, that we lay up treasure in heaven, mm. we shouldn't be given because we have to. We should be given because we have a vision for laying up treasures in heaven. Amen. Amen. Trent, you're next, but John always says, John D. says that God loves a hilarious giver because God is hilarious. That word joyful is hilarious. And I've been trying to teach my children that give away. Just watch and see what God's going to do. Let's not keep our hands closed. This is really beautiful. And God's been showing, giving us some opportunities for my children to just see. Dad? Okay. Trent. All right. That is um, an interesting question. I will say this. From our time we spent in Africa, you know, we really didn't understand everything when we went. We went with a heart of desire. And ultimately, over time, we made some de very deliberate choices to sell off vehicles that our mission had, 
had to use. I said, I can't drive this. You know, there's got to be a way to get ourselves uh, to identify more with the people that we are trying to reach. And we didn't do that well enough. That's, that's probably one of my biggest regrets. Um, and, you know, the, the compound where we lived was, was more secure than, than the people we were reaching, you know, could experience on daily life or in their daily existence. You know, and so I think it's really is something that we need to, to be conscious of. On the other hand, I think one of the things, and this is, this is my opinion, but I think one of the things that has driven this idea of, of money going to make a comfortable lifestyle for the missionary is because it's so hard to get people to go. And so you pray the Lord of the harvest that he'll raise up laborers to, to, to go in. And yet you almost have to, to buy them into that position uh, to make that happen. And so I don't completely fault how that works at times. I don't like it. Um, I wish, you know, there was, was a different way. But, you know, sometimes it is, it's even ignorance, I think, that happens that, you know, we are so comfortable. I, I, I just want to tell you, you, mm. you go live in a, in a third world or a developing country for a few years, and you will not stop praising God for the blessings we have. To have a road that, that you can drive on and not fear potholes and, and health care and all of those things, we are insulated beyond our, even our own understanding or our own comprehension. And so therefore, we feel like you know, even the smallest steps downward, you might say, are almost too difficult, and, and somehow, somehow we've got to do better at bridging that gap and, and addressing those, those needs. I do appreciate people that, that will step out and, and forsake some comforts, but I think we need to do better at, at being more intentional about living among the people that we, that we go to reach and not isolating ourselves um, from them. Some of the most precious stories that I could tell you are about times, you know, when we, we ate rat meat and we, we, we drank things that, that you just could hardly imagine how you were going to come out of it alive. <laughs> and yet those were the very moments where deep friendships and, and, and the potential of the gospel uh, came mm. into our experience. Mm. 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 And so... And so, you know, I don't know all the answers to this, but I do know there's deep needs in the world, and there is so much more that we can be doing. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just going to climb up on a soapbox here for a minute. Go no for one it. Asks for Go this. for it. Um, but back to this idea of, of businesses and how this, how this can work. I wish that we would get a vision for our businesses to serve the kingdom of God. Yeah. We have potential that is so massive in our Anabaptist world that, that we hardly even realize it. And what little things can we do, even in our own communities? Okay, and, and we have this problem right here. It's not just over in the foreign field that, that the, the standard and the level of living that we often experience is pretty difficult to attain. But, but, but what can we do there, there are people that will never attend a church. They will never come to an assembly like this, and yet you work side by side with them every day. And how can we turn our workplace and our business into a gospel machine? Praise God. Amen. Woo. Come on, let's go. This, tomorrow, let's, let's get going. Let's, let's, uh, Rob, I need to hang out with you brothers more. Okay, one more question. We have about uh, six more we can't take. I'm sorry. We'll take one more. Kevin, how does an abuse victim get help to find healing without, and this could probably be at a, with a counselor, with the elder, with family, without gossiping about the one who did the abusing? 
Uh, first of all, Kevin, uh, bad news from a bad heart. Would they have a bad heart, you think, in sharing that? I actually would not call that gossip to go talk to someone to resolve an issue. Um, I would encourage you to go to whoever that is. If it's a leader, start with there. If it needs to go to the authorities, whatever kind of abuse it is, it needs to, it needs to go to the right people. But then it needs to stay with them. Uh, do what you got to do to fix it. And the leaders don't need to be gossiping about it either. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's not hard to, it's not complicated to handle difficult situations. I mean, yeah, it might be complicated, but we make it more complicated than it should. Like, if there's an issue, go, go talk to somebody. Uh, that's not gossip, but don't tell 500 people. That's not gossip. Yeah, it's when you hear something and then you pass it on to the next person. Hmm. Um, it's, it's not that and, difficult. And so in brotherhood, and let's say this is a closed brotherhood right here, and we're all brothers in the same congregation, and uh, one of us is overtaken in a sin, King James, and those of you who are spiritual are restoring me, hmm. and so you need to discuss it among yourselves how to do this and brothers meeting, however we accomplish that, and what forms of discipline or forgiveness or whatever restoration or help and accountability or whatever, that's not gossip. Am I correct? Yeah, I and we it, try to keep it right. Keep here. it within the people that needs to know about it, and then it don't go further. The problem is, is learning to keep it there. Mm -hmm. um, I think you all know what I mean. <laughs> okay, uh, Philip, do you have a word? I'm not sure, but I, I would say if if I'm talking about a problem. <laughs> And, and talking about it pertains or is an endeavor to resolve the problem out of care for all parties involved, that's different. That's being a peacemaker. That's helping heal things up. But if I am just passing on news and there's no goal to help fix the problem, I'm just passing on a juicy tidbit about so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and it's just simply news, that's not healthy. But if it's talking about it as a brotherhood with care in our heart for this person or talking about an issue I have that, some, that someone hurt me or abused me, it's all about trying to fix the problem. So I think it comes down to does the issue pertain to you in helping restore this mess or this problem? Is it a redemptive effort or is it just simply news to just pass on? I think it, the, the question is, is does it pertain to you talking about it being healthy and helpful. If so, it's probably a good thing. But if it's simply just news and juicy tidbits, I think you should probably not say a word at all and rather pray for the person and get a heart of love for the person instead of just enjoying talking about them. Because I think too often we find ourselves enjoying talking about people's problem because it makes us feel good. I feel somehow improved or helped or higher up because I'm talking about somebody else's issue and problem. And that's never a loving, caring heart. And that is a dangerous thing. 